In this video, we're going to introduce Turing machines and informally describe how they work and what they're all about. Let's begin by putting the Turing machine into some context. We've already talked about some other kinds of machines. We've talked about finite state machines and we've talked about non-deterministic push-down automata. Uh, now we're introducing a new kind of machine, the Turing machine. With each one of these machines we have a class of languages. For finite state machines we have the regular languages. Finite state machines describe regular languages and regular languages can each be described by a finite state machine. Likewise, each non-deterministic pushdown automata describes a context-free language and each context-free language can be described by a pushdown automata. With the Turing machine we have a, another model of computation. Okay, it's, it's not very different from finite state machines and pushdown automata, but it is just enough different for it to model some new classes of languages. And in fact, we are going to talk about three new classes of languages that uh, are defined by the Turing machine concept. We're going to talk about decidable languages, Turing recognizable languages, and languages that are not even Turing recognizable. The finite state machine is a very simple model of computation. Likewise, the pushdown automata is a simple model of computation. Turing machines are also simple. They're not much more elaborate, yet the additional power that they have seems to be a substantial increase in power. And in fact, the Turing machine model of computation is sufficient to describe all kinds of computers. So it's a very, very powerful model. And it turns out these classes of languages that we can define around the Turing machine model decidable languages, Turing recognizable languages, and the full class of all languages, including those that are not Turing recognizable. Um, these classes are very uh, interesting and contain lots of languages that are no longer simple like regular languages or context-free languages. Before we go any further, let me talk about the different classes of languages a little bit more. So this is my diagram of the so-called language onion. This is a Venn diagram and each one of these circles represents a whole class of languages. So a regular language would be in this circle and a context-free language that's not also regular would be in this circle. So this is a Venn diagram and these circles are in fact showing proper subset relations. Each of these sets is distinct and different from the other sets. So our universe is the set of all languages and symbolized by the outer box. In the innermost circle we see the class of regular languages. Any language that's regular is in that little bubble. And around that we have context-free languages and of course every regular language is also context-free. Then we have the class of decidable languages. Every context-free language is decidable and furthermore every decidable language is Turing recognizable. So, but there are languages that are Turing recognizable that are not decidable. And finally, we have a set of all languages out here, the universe of all languages, and some of those are not even Turing recognizable. Before I describe how Turing machines work, I want to note that there are a number of variations about exactly how Turing machines work. So if you look at one textbook uh, or you're familiar with uh, one particular definition of Turing machines, it might not be exactly what I'm going to describe here. But interestingly, all the variations turn out to be equivalent. We'll talk a lot more about that later, but uh, whether um, the Turing machine that I describe here is exactly the same as the Turing machines you've seen described elsewhere, it doesn't matter. They all have the same equivalent power. Let's begin by talking about the data structures that these machines use. And we'll start with a finite state machine. Here, our only data structure, if you want to call it that, was the input string, a finite length string of the symbols from the input alphabet. And we have a current position, and of course as we go through the input we move from the left to the right, and we never back up. 
Then we went to the pushdown automatons. Uh, in a pushdown automaton, we have not only the input string, but we also have the stack over on the side, which I've symbolized here. And we can push and we can pop onto the stack. And so we have a second data structure in addition to the input string. With the Turing machine, we only have one uh, data structure, and that's what we call the tape. The tape is a sequence of cells. And here you see a cell with zero in it, a cell with one in it, one, zero. So each cell of the tape contains a symbol from the tape alphabet. And the tape is infinite in one direction. It has a left end over here and then it's infinite in the other direction. And we assume that it is filled with an infinite string of blanks. I use this symbol here to indicate that the cell has a blank, or uh, we can say the cell is empty. We also have the current position. This is what we call our tape head. And at, at any one moment in a computation, the head is positioned on one cell. During the computation, the head can move either to the right one step or it can move to the left one step. I mentioned before that the symbols on the tape come from an alphabet. And I'm going to be a little imprecise here and I'm just going to talk about a single alphabet of sigma, which is the uh, alphabet of the input characters. Uh, we may have just zeros and ones or we may have other symbols. We'll use the dollar sign in particular uh, to do the end of the tape or something like that. But I want to note that the blank symbol is special. Our input is initially on the tape and is the only thing on the tape. And the blank symbol is special because it is not in the alphabet. The input string does not contain any blanks. The blank is the special symbol that's used to fill the uh, infinite tape. So in our initial configuration, before the computation starts, we've got our input string on the tape. And the tape head is positioned at the very left end of the tape. We can move the tape head left or right. And we can also read, sometimes we say scan or look at, the symbol that's directly below the tape head. And we can also update the symbol. So we can update the cells of the tape as we are doing our computation. We can read a symbol and then we can write a new symbol in its place. And then we can move left or right to the adjacent symbol. Here's a picture of a, a Turing machine in the middle of some computation. We've got our tape and at any one point in the computation some of the cells at the left end have been used. So here's the portion of the tape that has been modified or used so far. It contains at least the input, the cells that were used for the input, and maybe some other cells have been used as well. And then out here, out to infinity, we have the unused portion of the tape, which, as I said, is filled with this special blank symbol. Here's the head, and so at this moment of computation, the head is positioned on this cell. It's looking at a zero. The Turing machine is controlled by a sort of finite state machine. I hesitate to say a finite state machine because we've defined formally what a finite state machine is. But this is similar uh, to that in that we have states and we have transitions between the states and we have an initial state. And we also have some final state, states which I'll mention in a moment. So this is considered to be the control portion of the Turing machine. We can also refer to it as the program, okay, because it describes what this particular Turing machine is going to do. It describes how a given Turing machine will operate on its input. So we call it a program because it turns out that it's very similar to empower to, and can do what uh, a co any computer program can do. Another thing I want to point out is our Turing machines are deterministic. Okay? This, we don't use non-determinism. We'll talk about non-determinism later and find out that non-determinism doesn't buy you any additional power. And that's a very interesting result. So we'll start out by defining our Turing machines to be deterministic and then later show that that is good enough. We get all the power we need from determinism.
Now let's talk about how the Turing machine operates. What are the rules that control its operation? At each step in a computation by a Turing machine, what do we do? Well, the Turing machine first looks at the current symbol that's underneath the tape head. So we look at the cell of the tape that we're positioned on and we ask what symbol is there. That determines which transition we take. And down here I talk more about that. We can also, then we update that cell. We write a new symbol to that cell, overwriting the symbol that we just read. And finally we move either one cell to the left or to the right. Okay, we do not stay put. We either move left or right. And we have this additional rule that if we are at the left end of the tape and we are trying to move left, then the Turing machine will stay put. It will not move left. So in our finite control, we're going to have a number of states and transitions between the states. And we're going to label the transitions using this notation here. Uh, we have a little arrow and a comma, and we have three different things. The first symbol is the one that we're reading. So we only take this transition if the tape head is positioned over a cell that contains, well, in this example, the symbol A. And then the symbol here is what we write. So we overwrite the cell that contain the A with the symbol B. And finally, we have either an R or an L, and that tells us whether to move right or left. Now you might say, well, why do we have to update the cell? Uh, we might want to just leave it alone. And in fact, we can do that quite simply by just writing the same symbol that we read. The control of the Turing machine is with a sort of finite state machine with the states and the transitions. We have an initial state and we have exactly two final states. One final state is called the accept state and one is called the reject state. So these states take effect immediately. The enter into an accept state or into a reject state. We immediately stop computation. So computation can end three ways, or it can, it can happen three ways. It can halt and accept, halt and reject, or it can fail to halt altogether. If it fails to halt, the machine keeps computing on and on forever. We call this looping. The machine is said to loop. So computation, if it halts, it halts because it enters either the accept state or the reject state. Whenever the machine enters the accept state, the computation will immediately come to a stop and halt. Whenever it enters the reject state, computation will immediately halt. But the machine may also fail to halt. And this is where it gets interesting because if it accepts, then it halts, and if it rejects, we know uh, that's a different outcome. But it may loop, in which case we don't really have an output or an outcome. So we have this, this third kind of result that our other machines didn't have. And most importantly, the Turing machine is deterministic. At every state uh, we have exactly one transition that we can take. We can either go this way or that way. We don't have any choices. It's not non-deterministic.